Uh, so I'll introduce myself momentarily. I do just want to give folks uh, a little overview of what we're going to cover today. So I'll start by introducing myself and then I will give a few different definitions or sort of uh, parameters, I guess, for crop planning uh, to sort of get you set up for what we're going to discuss and why. Uh, I'm going to talk about this concept of growing to order within that. And then we're going to look at crop cycles and tasks and production stages. And these are sort of three concepts that have a lot of interplay with each other. And then we're going to get into some of the essentials of crop planning, which is piecing all those things together. And then we're going to use speckled pea to do a bit of an example about what a basic crop planning uh, setup looks like. And then I do have a spreadsheet set up, a very detailed one we'll take a look through that'll show you how I organize all this information. And, and then after that, we'll do a question period. And what I'll also do then is um, introduce what we're going to cover in the second webinar, which is going to go into a little more depth in terms of what we're going to cover today. Uh, as uh, Laura said, if you have questions at any time, put them in the chat uh, and I will try to answer them as I go. Some days I'm really good at that, other days not so good. So if I don't answer your question, uh, don't, feel, uh, don't feel ignored by me. Uh, it's just my limited capacity for multitasking. Uh, and there's some questions I'm gonna say, ah, you gotta wait. Uh, because there are things we're going to cover in the next session. So I don't want to dip, dip into that stuff early. The suspense will bring you back, and that's the goal. So, okay. So uh, thanks for the uh, introduction there, Laura. Uh, I am Chris Thoreau, and I was a commercial microgreens producer for uh, 10 years. I'm not producing commercially right now. I am just growing at home and doing a lot of work with crop planning. It's, it's this aspect of production that I've been really interested in and have put a lot of time and effort into. And uh, so that's sort of my focus right now with a piece of software uh, called Seedleaf, uh, which uh, I'll maybe talk a little bit about later and we'll take a quick look at. So my crop planning, this is here is my first official crop planner. Uh, I apologize for the colors. Uh, early in those days, I wasn't so into formatting. I just wanted stuff to stand out. Um, but to give you a sense of sort of where things started for me, this was our first version. Then I made the very wise move to uh, pastel colors, which significantly reduced my stress level when looking at spreadsheets uh, because they are very stressful to look at. Uh, and then over time, as that spreadsheet sort of evolved, uh, I learned about just more techniques with spacing and layout that made it easier and easier to use. And I will say within that, because I do all my spreadsheets on Google Sheets, I actually had to wait for certain features to uh, become available on Google Sheets to implement some of the uh, things that I wanted to do uh, because Microsoft Excel really had all the features I needed, but Sheets is still working on some of those. So I really went through an evolution of spreadsheets, which really helped me understand crop planning to a really a deeper degree. And then that evolved into our online version of the crop planner. Uh, which, which is called seed leaf. And so that really takes a lot of the, the, the intensity of a spreadsheet out of the picture. And so the reason I talk about that evolution in, in, in spreadsheets to an online version actually has to do, again, through, that, through developing these spreadsheets, it's really helped uh, my understanding of crop planning and the principles and processes. And it's kind of one of the reasons I wanted to do this series is to help you uh, evolve your understanding of crop planning as well. I actually think it's one of the most important aspects of production in terms of keeping you organized and focused. And probably more specifically, we are talking about crop planning and order management because the orders from our customers are the thing that really drives the process. So let's get into things here. Uh, so basically starting off with a very basic definition of crop planning. And, and actually, Laura, do you, how much do you talk about uh, crop planning in your course? Oh, I, uh, are you on mute? I think you're on mute, sorry. Muted here. Yeah, good. I muted it myself. Uh, we do cover the very basics of it. Uh, my The program, the course is very introductory. So it's uh, starting a business um, to into the crop planning, growing basic standard varieties, um, but we do keep it pretty surface level. And I was intentional with that in the beginning, not wanting to overwhelm new growers. Uh, but I found as people have started growing, 
um, there's been a need and a desire to get more in depth uh, as people are growing. And I think that it can be beneficial, even if you are a brand new grower, just to start to understand the depth that you are, you're going to go as you expand your business. So, um, so it's, it's covered in an introductory uh, type way. Right. Good. So hopefully some of the stuff that I talk about is a little familiar to folks. And so it's not, I know for some of you, it's all going to be very new and some of you are going to be bored. So uh, it's hard to please everybody. So I apologize for that. Uh, okay. So multiple screens here. So crop planning is the process of determining your crop sowing requirements based on your confirmed or potential product needs. And I know that's very sort of a mouthful, but basically, I mean, you sow what your orders tell you to sow is kind of what that uh, breaks down to. And an important thing here in terms of terminology, it's important to understand that you grow a crop and you sell a product. So this is just sort of the language I use to differentiate uh, things at different stages of production. So what we're doing is we're using specific crop and product information to make crop production calculations based on our orders. And this will be things like our product weight, our crop yield, our crop days to maturity. So these are all things that allow us to make very, very accurate calculations based on our orders to get our uh, production uh, going. Now, a very important concept here is we always work backwards from a set harvest date to determine our crop soaking and or sowing dates if you're, if you're not uh, soaking a crop. Uh, and I'll say here another um, principle. So I have very few absolutes uh, when I talk about microgreens because everybody's system is very different. But this is one of my absolutes is um, you must have a set harvest day every week. You don't want to harvest on Fridays one week and Thursdays the next week and Saturday the next week. It's always Friday. In 10 years of commercial production, I changed my harvest date once. And that was just like so extreme of a case. And it was a real pain in the ass, actually. So uh, that's important for consistency for you. It's important for consistency with your staff, if you've got staffing. And it's important for your customers, you know, because uh, your delivery uh, is going to be related to your harvest. So that's really, really important. And without that, crop planning becomes extremely, extremely difficult. Um, and then there's this idea of tasks. So I use this term tasks for the actions we take to start and maintain the crop growing process. And we'll take a look at this in a little bit of a visual, uh, but each task basically represents a transformation, seed to crop, crop to product. And so these are the things uh, I like to focus on. Things like watering, uh, watering is also a task, but it isn't a transformative task. It's just a, it's a, a supportive task. So. Don't worry about that, that terminology so much, but I'm really interested uh, in the transformation processes in terms of how to do our crop planning. So some of the main tasks we look at are soaking our seed, sowing and covering our seed, uncovering our seed from a germination state or uncovering our crop and then harvesting that crop so it becomes a product. So this is stuff that should be fairly familiar to a, a lot of you already. And so the driving sort of thing behind this is that every crop you sow should have a purpose. You should never have to guess at how much of any crop to plant. You should always know what you're planting and why you're planting it. So that's the thing that's driving this whole, whole process. So some of you may, I mean, you might cover this as well, Laura, some of you might know this idea of sort of growing to order or sowing to order. And this is the idea that you are only growing the crops you require to meet your order needs, which is kind of uh, what I talked about already. You're not just sort of going, ah, let's try 25 trays of this this week. You are growing 18 trays because that is what you have calculated you need for your week. So, oh, sorry, didn't have that up there, okay. So yeah, that's uh, really, and this comes down to uh, some important principles in terms of why crop planning is important, which is what I'm gonna look at now. So I'm gonna do a quick pause there. I mean, I covered a lot very quickly, Anything not making sense to anybody in terms of the terms and everything I've laid out there. And again, you can throw something in the chat at any time uh, because we're moving pretty quick at a certain point. He's like, ah, is he talking about a crop or a product? Is this a task or a cycle? So uh, throw it out anytime and hopefully uh, I can catch it as we go. So why is crop planning important and, and, and why are we, we sort of teaching you about, about it? So number one, it helps with production 
accuracy. It really, the basic way of looking at this is it helps ensure you don't have too much or too little crop. Now, if you have too much crop, you've been spent, you spent money on seed, soil, and labor to grow a crop that really doesn't have a home. It, and the, 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 the thing there is it's going to get wasted, it's going to get composted, or you're going to be forced to eat way more microgreens in a week than you were expecting. Um, and if, if you have too little crop, you're not going to have enough to meet your product needs, which means you're going to lose sales. So having the, the right amount is really, really important. It's very, very rare that you get it exactly what you need, but it, it gets you in a really nice range to make sure you're going to uh, have a good balance there. So crop planning really helps uh, calculate and organize our crop production cycles and our crop needs. And as I talked about, we're, we're really driven by customer orders, determining how much uh, of a crop we need to sow for each of our cycles. Um, here again, we're looking at calculations. So if you have a product that's just sunflower shoots in it, that's pretty easy to do crop planning for. But if it's got sunflower shoots, arugula, and kohlrabi, then the calculations get more complex. So having a process for that goes a long way towards keeping you organized and on track. Uh, it's a great way to help organize your customer orders. Because your orders are driving the process, that's something you need to, um, you need to record. And that's going to help you on harvest day on packing and for deliveries. So this helps with all that. Um, really very useful for financial and business planning. And this is where crop planning is really, can be really useful if you are new to growing microgreens. And the idea is you can use your crop plan and your product prices to get some estimates about what a season or what the finances might look like for your business for a year. And this can actually, this is really crucial if you wanna do a business plan to get a loan or you wanna do a business plan just to better understand your business. Knowing all these little details seems like a lot, but it's the only way that you can really accurately do your finances because you need to have figures to work with in order to generate those numbers. That said, many business plans just kind of make up numbers and that's not really a business plan. That's not really gonna help you in the long run if your numbers aren't accurate. Uh, really useful for record keeping. So having a spreadsheet or an online program that helps you, uh, it's good for sort of your own auditing. Uh, if you wanna track something or as you get bigger, there is a chance you might be audited by a local health authority or uh, you know, if you have any sort of certifications or anything like that. Record keeping is super important. And so crop planning and recording is kind of the way we, we make those records. Um, and in general, it, it saves you time and money. Um, once you get into a good crop planning process, uh, you get into a pretty good routine and that really just keeps you on task and focused on what you need to be doing. And so when you've got preset calculations, uh, you know, everything's sort of in your system, uh, it makes it really easy. It can take a lot of time to set up, but most things we do are really front loaded in order to make sure in the future things are easy after that. Okay, so gonna move on to our next section of crop cycles, uh, looking at these ideas of elements, tasks, and stages here. So again, if folks have any questions about uh, what we just covered, go ahead and throw them in the chat. And I have a feeling questions might come up in this section, but hopefully I've laid out this graphic in a way that makes sense. So, all right. So I've mentioned this already. Our customers place orders of our products, and when they do so, it basically generates tasks. So the tasks are the steps we need to take to start and maintain our crop cycles. And without an order, there's really no point in growing anything. So that order really kicks the whole thing in, into, uh, into uh, action. So the process starts with seed. Uh, you know, without an order, seed is just something you have to store, which makes it not very useful. And so what we want to do is we want to transform seed into a crop. So the task that we do that is either soaking or sowing the seed, uh, depending what it is, and then covering it. As I'm sure you know, we generally sow seeds on the soil surface, cover it with another tray or some version of that. Uh, if you don't know that, well, now you do. So that's how it happens. Um, now, once you have sowed and covered your crop or, or your seed, you now have a crop. So like sowing the seed is the process that transforms your seed into a crop. So my sort of rule is as soon as that seed hits the soil, it's a crop. 
we cover it up and then it starts its first stage of growth, which is just the germination stage. And microgreens grow through this, your annual vegetables in your gardens go through this. So it's something that's probably familiar to a lot of people. And that's our first stage. As it grows, the germination stage ends and we uncover that crop so it can get light and photosynthesize, which brings us to our second stage, which is our photosynthesis or greening stage. People have different names for this, but what we're basically trying to do is convert light energy into sugar so the plant can continue to grow. Uh, once the crop reaches the end of its uh, growth cycle, it is time to harvest. So this is another task that creates a transformation and that's the thing that transformed our crop into a product is the harvest time. And then of course, once we have a product, we can deliver that to our customer. So that's kind of the flow of things. Our process starts and ends with the customer placing an order and then receiving that order. And as many of you have probably experienced that you can, um, uh, you know, you get into a bit of a cycle with this. So that stuff becomes easier. And we'll take a look at uh, some of those cycles uh, momentarily here. So I'm not seeing any questions. So hopefully everybody's just nodding along going, okay, good. Oh, that makes sense. Oh, that's interesting. Um, or something along those lines. So these are sort of the, the, the parts that I wanna break things down into just taking the customer out of it. So when we look at it from this point of view, we kind of have, okay, I'll come back to that question. Okay, so here we're breaking things down into the sort of three things that are, that are interrelating. Are your elements, which is our, in this case is our seed, our crop and our product, our tasks, which is soaking, uncovering and harvesting, and then our stages, which are basically our germination stage and our photosynthesis stage. Now, some of you might have some more stages within there. Some people do a blackout. There's, a, a, there's a, a more complex crop cycle for sure, but we're gonna stick with this very, very uh, simple crop cycle in this regard. And again, the focus for me is really on the tasks. Uh, and these are the things I'm most interested in because they are the actions that keep our crop production cycle in motion. And, and, and it's kind of the task is answering this question of, what do I need to do today or figure out today to keep my crop, my crop production cycle on track? So that's what our tasks do. Again, watering is a task and, and whatnot, but watering is, it's, it's not a transformative task. It's just maintaining your crop. So the transformation is key because the timing is really important. If you have a set harvest date, if you don't sow your crop by a certain date, that crop is going to be late. Or if you sow it too early, that crop is going to be early. And you've all had these problems, I'm sure. So... Uh, okay, so determining the best harvest date for you. So now this is, again, this, this is a, it depends uh, answer. Um, so determining your best harvest date is not, is gonna be about a, a couple of things. One is gonna be what works best for your schedule. If you're just getting into microgreens production, chances are you might be working somewhere else. So how are you gonna balance this all out in terms of when your time is most available for harvest? It tends to be one of your biggest um, jobs of the week because there's you're harvesting, you're washing, you're drying, you're packaging, you're refrigerating, you have all these steps to go through. And so you need to think about that in terms of how that might work with a schedule if you have limited time. The other thing is, is what do your customers want or when would be the best time for your um, customers to, to, for you to harvest and deliver? Now, our model was really based on harvesting and delivering in the same day. Uh, lots of reasons for that, which I can talk about later if we have time. Um, and so for us, we ended up with this Tuesday, Friday schedule. So we did two harvests a week. And one reason to do that is we, all, we could always give customers a fresh crop. So grocers, restaurants, I mean, if, you, if you're only delivering once a week, by the time you get to the day before your next delivery, the product they have on hand is six days old, so it's not as fresh. Um, and so that, that, um, that two, uh, two times a week harvest really helped make sure your, product, your customer always had a fresh product. Second is, I mean, when you think about the flow of a restaurant or maybe a grocery store, your, your Friday harvest really determines your sort of weekend volume. Uh, so restaurants are often busier on the weekend than they are during the week. 
So you get Friday harvest to get them through the weekend and into Monday, and then your Tuesday harvest uh, and delivery gets them through the week. And so those might be different volumes. Maybe you're dropping off four pounds of something on Friday, but just two pounds on Tuesday. So you can balance that stuff out and shift it along. Uh, the other thing is, is if you were doing a farmer's market, you would generally want to harvest the day before your farmer's market. And a lot of farmer's markets are on Saturday. So that really pushes that Friday harvest. So um, yeah, there's a lot of things to, th to factor in, but it's gonna really gonna be a matter of your needs and your customer needs. And if you're doing a farmer's market, that Friday for the Friday harvest for the Saturday market is almost an absolute. So hopefully that gives you some insights there, Melanie, on that. Um, okay, what's next? Okay, so now I'm gonna take a look at these, these uh, what I'm calling the crop planning essentials because um, it's kind of a mix of the elements and the tasks all together. So we're going to start out, uh, so we're going to look at seed, crops, products, customers, orders, harvest dates. And so these are things I've already um, looked at, and we're going to take a look at them in a little more detail to understand the characteristics of them that we need to take into consideration. So starting with seed, and for, for this um, presentation, I'm, I'm just gonna focus on speckled pea. It's a crop I've grown a lot of. I'm sure most of you or many of you are growing speckled pea or a similar pea. So hopefully it's a crop you are uh, familiar with. So in terms of characteristics of our seed, uh, so we've got our soak time. How long do we need to soak the seed? Uh, in some cases, you're not soaking the seed. In some cases, it might be 20 minutes. In some cases, it might be a couple hours. And in some cases, you might be soaking the seed overnight. And in the case of pea, this was always an overnight soak for me, which made crop planning a little more complicated because now I was soaking something on one day and sowing at the next. So the second thing is our sowing rate. You know, how much seed are we using per tray or, or growing unit? And this is really important in understanding our costs associated with that. And then yes, of course, our cost per unit weight. So uh, this is for cost calculations and uh, this is gonna depend on how much we are paying for our seed and that might fluctuate over time. Uh, and you can, can include your delivery in that as well if you have a delivery charge for your seed. So it really helps you calculate what your production costs are very, very accurately. Okay, so that's our seed. Again, we transform our seed into a crop so our crop has some uh, important characteristics. So two, the, the main one I use is this idea of days to maturity. And this is used in vegetable production as well and, and flower production. How long from sowing, how long is the period from sowing to harvest? And so, you know, with, with vegetable crops, you're looking at 30, 60, 90 days, but with microgreens, you know, it could be as low as six or seven days and up to 20 or 30, depending on the crop. So there's a lot of variability there. So uh, that's our days to maturity. And then I use uh, the term days to germinate. And so this is how long the crop stays covered after sowing. And those two things are, are obviously related and those days to germinate are included in those days to maturity. Uh, then we need to think about our crop volume. And this is kind of the tray that, you know, what I, the main thing here is your tray size. And, and why I say that is we think, well, pea seed grows a pea crop, but pea seed can actually grow multiple pea crops. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. So it's important to distinguish your seed from your crop because they can be different. Uh, and then, oh, sorry, uh, last one there is our expected yield. So we really need to know what each tray of, of microgreens can yield because that's gonna determine how much of that we need to grow in order to meet our product needs. <clears throat> Excuse me. So now we're looking at our product. Now the product is our front facing, uh, in, essence, in essence, it's our front facing crop. It's the thing that customers engage with. Your customers don't order crops, your customers order products, which are made up of crops, either a single crop, like we're talking about with pea shoots or multiple crops if you're doing something that's mixed. So uh, the product has to have a crop or crops uh, it needs to have a size uh, or weight, and you know, those are kind of the same thing. Um, and then they need to have a price. And so 
The size and weight relates to our crop yield. Those are the two things that interact to determine how much we need to sow. And then our price obviously determines the revenue that we generate from that uh, product. Now, in terms of customers, from a crop planning perspective, the only thing we really need to know about our customer really is the customer name. Like, who is this product going to? But there's two other uh, things that are quite important in terms of record keeping and understanding where your sales are going. And this is uh, something that crop planning really helps organize is what type of customer it is. <clears throat> so they could be a restaurant, market, wholesale, um, CSA, uh, anything like that, cafe. You can create as many different categories as you want. And that way you can understand on, uh, you know, on a seasonal basis which sort of uh, customer type uh, is, is uh, your products are going to. And that allows you to focus on the different customers depending on how those sales look. And then having a delivery address, you know, for a lot of times you're delivering and maybe a route. So if you have many, many customers and need to send folks out on different routes to get to all those customers, that's some good basic information about your customer uh, to record. <clears throat> and then our order. So, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Again, our order is driving this whole process. So an order requires a customer or a virtual customer. And I will talk about virtual customers in webinar two. It needs a product or products. And that would include a product size. Uh, we need a quantity of each product. So how much you need, a price for each product, and then a single harvest date. So I organize my uh, orders based on a single harvest date, even if it's the same customer ordering multiple times a week. So if I have a Tuesday, Friday harvest and delivery, and a customer wants a delivery on both of those days, I consider those different orders. And the reason being is they often, you know, they often change at different rates. So it could be that a, 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 a client says, well, we're getting busier on the weekend, so we need to up our Friday order, or we're getting slower during the week, so we need to lower our, our Tuesday order. So I find keeping those separate actually makes crop planning a little bit easier, uh, even though it means more spreadsheet cells. So it's a, it's a pain like that. Uh, and then the last thing is our harvest date. And so I, I've talked about this quite a bit already. It's really important that you have a set date for your harvest. Do not change it around unless it's an extreme emergency. And even then try not to do it. Um, and keeping in mind that you can have multiple harvests a week. And you know, the driving factor behind that for, for me has always been uh, the ability to give people the um, freshest product possible. And it actually helps you uh, regulate your, your product uh, with any customer. So you can sort of tweak it twice a week instead of only once a week being able to sort of change the volume that you're giving to them in terms of products. Okay, <clears throat> so those are our sort of essentials that are driving our process and our calculations. So. I'm gonna move on to an example with uh, speckled pea, but did everybody, uh, did that make sense to everybody? Or any questions on that? Hope there, hope, I'm hoping there's some nodding. If you're kind of thinking like, ah, oh, I kind of wanna ask this, but I'm not sure I should, you should ask it. Um, and I'm just gonna take a sip of water to give you a chance to type something out if need be. Otherwise we'll move on pretty quick here. The thing is, I know as soon as I start the next section, somebody's going to start putting a question in there. So that's the thing. Okay, so Stephanie has just spoken for everybody. Apparently, you're all fine. So again, uh, ask a question anytime I can come back to it. Okay, so I mean, I actually imagine this is really boring for all you folks, but uh, hopefully this is useful. Uh, okay, so let's take a look at, at our speckled pea. So even though the process, so stepping back a little bit, even though the process kind of starts with the customer, the customer cannot place an order without uh, products to choose from. So kind of your first thing, your, your first two things you're doing is you are, are developing your product line. So you kind of know what crops you want to grow and then you want to determine how to sell them. Because until you've done that, you have nothing to offer to potential customers. So um, here we have our, our a sample product line with speckled pea. 
we have three sizes and I'm very sorry, I'm pretty sure most of you are in the US, uh, but uh, we don't recognize Imperial units in Canada. So I'm going to do everything in grams, <laughs> but obviously everything uh, here uh, holds true for, for ounces or whatever unit you're using. So here's a product line that has three sizes with different prices. Um, those prices are just random. And then we do a live tray, that's a 1020 tray. And hopefully everybody knows what our 10 by 20 inch tray is. That's the very standard tray we use. And then this, this product line has a five by five tray, this little cute little tray of, uh, of um, um, uh, pea shoots that we were selling live that maybe is really popular at the market. So this is our product line. And so we might have a brochure we give to our customers to say, here's what you can order. And then we've got our crops. Now we actually have, we could have three crops here. I won't get into that, but we have two crops. We have our speckled pea in our 10 by 20 tray for both our cut product and our live 10, 20 tray. And then we have our, our speckled pea in our five by five tray. So we have these two products that we're growing or sorry, these two crops uh, that we're growing from the same seed. So, so this is what I meant when I said, you know, a speckled pea doesn't just grow a speckled pea crop there are differences in these crops. So one is our tray size. What's the other difference between these crops? Can anybody point that out for me? So you can not listen to me ramble on for a bit here. Uh, yield is different. So yield, uh, yeah, so yield, uh, so the yield here is given as uh, 400 grams for the speckled pea that you're gonna cut. And it's given as one for the five by five tray because uh, your five by five tray yields one five by five tray. So that's how we look at it um, in terms of uh, how we do the calculations. So yeah, I think I saw, yeah, so days, a couple of folks saw days to maturity. So, oh, hit that button accidentally. Let's go back there. Um, why does my live tray have eight days to maturity while my other tray has nine days to maturity? Oh, is this a stumper? Yes, so that's, that is, yeah. So basically, I mean, you've got as soon as, so, uh, okay, this is good. So yeah, so you're, you're, you're getting it a little earlier. Um, now, my five by five tray here is a crop. When does that five by five tray become a product? Oh, it's a, it's a live tray. We're not harvesting it. When you take it off the shelf, yes. So um, so what, what I would say to be more specific it is, is it when it leaves your growing system? So if you're in a, um, when you're in a, say a greenhouse or in your, your grow room, soon as that crop, literally as soon as you leave the door with that five by five tray, it ceases to be a crop and it becomes a product. And, and another thing that might happen is, you know, you put it in a box or you put it into something. So then it's in that state. The other thing to, um, the other thing to consider here, yeah. So when you're growing microgreens, your system, you've got the perfect system. You've got the temperature under control. You've got your dehumidifier, you've got your lights, you've got all these things going on. Your customer doesn't have those things. So yeah, uh, what, one of the one of the things about selling live trays is you're taking you're taking usually your live uh, product, uh, your live crop from perfect conditions to often the worst conditions. And so I know people really like the idea of um, uh, selling live trays to restaurants, but a restaurant kitchen is about the worst environment that you can have for um, for uh, for growing microgreens. So. Little bit of a uh, aside there. Okay, so uh, da, 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 da. so da, da, da. there was another question here. What if the order and the sewing doesn't match the delivery dates? Okay, we're going to come to that. This is this is this is this is the this is the sixty four thousand dollar question actually. So we'll come to that after. Okay, so this is this is just our looking at speckled pea. So we have all this information here between our crops and our products. So let's look at how all these things relate. Let's look at our product orders, our theoretical product orders for June 24th. For all our customers, we have 25 small P, 100 grams at five, $5 each, so 2,500 grams. So we know, our, we know our weight, 
and we know our revenue, eight medium P, 20 large P. So again, I'm just displaying this information here, but our spreadsheet would just calculate this all for us. Very, very simple calculations generally. So we have a total weight of 13,500 grams. Don't even have any idea what that is in pounds, but 27 pounds maybe. Um, and our revenue of $605. And in this order for the state, we also have four live trays at uh, I think they were $15 each. So that's $60. So we have some information here that we can tie together for all these things. So the very, very basic calculation here is our total weight of all our products, which is 13,500 grams, divided by our yield per tray, tells us how many trays to plant. Like, I mean, this is, I mean, you see it, it's like, oh yeah, duh. Um, so um, it, it's very obvious, and we'll talk about why it gets more complicated in a second. Uh, now, how many of you have, have, uh, have sowed 0.75 trays in your life? I really hope it's none of you. <laughs> Um, I'm just going to assume people are frantically typing, no, never, uh, but then decided not to. So yeah, so we're going to round that up to 34. So we're always, as a, uh, we'll talk about this in the next session a bit, you always round up. You're never going to sell a portion of a tray. 33.8 trays rounds up to 34 and 33.1 trays rounds up to 34. We don't use the, the rounding up at 0.5 rule. We always round up. 33.1, uh, if you need 33.1 trays, sowing 33 trays will not give you enough crop. So you always sow a little more in that regard. Uh, we have our four live trays, of course, that we need to include in there. And so we are basically sowing 38, 10 by 20 trays. And the value of that is gonna be $665. So th th they're, they're very, very simple calculations, but they, there we go, thank you. <laughs> um, the, uh, the very simple calculations, but part of it is organizing things and keeping it in a structure that you can understand starts to become very, very difficult. So for that harvest date, we know how much product we need. What's the next thing we need to figure out? Yeah, so we're going to need how much seed, yeah, how much to plant. Well, we know how much to plant. We, uh, we want to plant 38 trays. When, okay, so there we go. We were going the, the who, what, when, yes, good, exactly. So we had that information on our chart back there. It's our sort of preloaded crop information. And, and maybe to pre-answer a question, when you're getting started out, you know, you're gonna have guidelines. So, so Laura, I'm sure you talk about, here's your expected crop cycle for sunflower or peas or anything else. So that's always a good starting point. If you don't know, you just start with something, but then you might realize, you know what? You know, it's not nine days in my system, you know, maybe in Laura's system where she is, it's nine days, but it's eight days for me. It's warm here, you know, it's low humidity, it's perfect conditions. So, so you adjust that stuff as you go. So a good starting point is, is what's out there. And there's lots of guidelines for, for lots of different crops out there. So our harvest date is June 24th. Our days to maturity are nine. And so that tells us what our soaking date is, which is June 15th. And we'll take a look at a visual of this in a second. Again, uh, this, this P is an overnight soak. So I'm soaking on the 15th and I'm sowing on the 16th. And then it sends, spends four days in a germination stage. So it gets uh, uncovered on June 20th. And as a little bit of a thing, uh, you know, it's important to do your crop planning calculations uh, to a certain degree. But my, my sort of rule of thumb is to not count on your crop calculations for everything. So this uncover date, even though I calculate it, I don't ever look at what my software tells me for an un uncover date. I always look at the crop. Uh, and part of it is, you know, an uncover date of June 20th doesn't tell me, should I uncover it in the morning? Should I uncover it in the evening? Should I maybe uncover that Tuesday night or maybe Wednesday morning? Like there could be some variability depending on, on generally on temperature. 
So it's really important to not get to that your sewing date and stuff is usually pretty solid, but other things like uh, your uncover date or stuff like watering, that's going to change a little bit. So that's something you should really use your intuition and experience with to determine you're doing that um, at the right time. Uh, and you, as I'm sure many of you experienced, you could be looking at a crop on, on Sunday night going, oh, that almost needs to be uncovered. And then you come back Monday morning, you're like, oh my God, that should have been uncovered already. These crops are on very, very fast cycles. And so uh, you need to learn in your system when the optimum time is. And yeah, from, from morning at nine o'clock to afternoon at three o'clock, your crop can go through significant change. So yeah, so not getting too caught up sometimes in, <laughs> in what your crop plan says, despite all the other stuff I've told you already. Uh, it's really important for you as the manager of your production system to use your intuition with that stuff as well. So if we look at that, going back to sort of our display here, our harvest date is June 24th. We take our harvest date minus our days, nine days to maturity. Oops, uh, takes us back to June 15th. So that tells us when our sowing date is. Our days in germination are four. So we go from our sowing date and we count now forward. And that tells us our uncover time is June 19th. So this is important. Like when I'm modeling or creating a spreadsheet, this is the sort of stuff I have to go through in my head. Uh, in order to do a calculation. And that, now there's lots of different ways to do this. So for example, I mean, if you look, where are we here? There's sort of this space right here from June 19th to June 24th, which is your, your photosynthesis stage. So another way to do this, instead of using your days to maturity and your days to germination could be, well, I'm gonna calculate it based on days in the dark and days in the light. And days in dark plus days in light equals your days to maturity. So people, you can take different approaches to how you do the calculations here. The reason I use days to maturity is because that's a very well-established term and concept we use in growing just about everything. So I stick with that. And then days to germination, as you can see, is included in your days to germinate, uh, days to maturity. Um, and it's just the, the, basically the first part of that, uh, that, uh, that process. That does confuse people a little bit because they think, oh, my days to maturity plus my days to, to germination should be 13 days. But you don't add them together because your germination days are included in your days to maturity. Okay, make sense there? Okay, so I think this next slide is about to answer. Uh, I mean, this is the next slide. Uh, I'm hoping there's like fireworks and everything goes crazy and everyone's like, oh, now I get it. Um, if not, um, then this has just been a waste of a morning, really. <laughs> no, no. Okay, so uh, so the, the question earlier, and I actually just want to scroll up to it. I don't know if other people have the chat open, is what if the order and the sewing doesn't match the delivery date? Example, it takes 10 days or, or 14 days. So this is exactly why we do crop planning. We don't sow everything on the same day in order to harvest. This is why we work backwards from the harvest date with our individual crop information. So we've just been talking about pea shoots, but so here you can see, oh, come down here. So pea shoots up on the top here, but my cilantro uh, cycle might be a day longer. My sunflower shoots might be a couple of days shorter. My radish shoots are even shorter. So what we're doing in order to get everything on that, um, on that, that harvest day is we're determining a soaking or sowing day for each crop individually. Um, so we could have two harvest days, but multiple sow dates. Um, yes, so we're gonna take a look at some, this is a good question. You're already thinking up to the next slide, this is great. So this, this cycle here, and we'll, we'll take a look at these actually in spreadsheet form in a moment as well. This here is just showing a single cycle with, with, with these crops for a set harvest date, which is our June 24th date. But you can see we had a, a harvest on Friday, June 17th as well. And that itself would have had a cycle before it as well. So we're, we're gonna have these repeating cycles. And if we move to, so here's sort of the same thing when we're looking at it from a, a two harvest a week perspective. So we've got our, we're sowing on June 12th, which is gonna be our June 21st harvest. And then we're sowing on June 15th, which is gonna be our uh, June 24th harvest. So we're, we've got these cycles that are, that are overlapping a lot of the time. And so really, what, this is why focusing on tasks is so important. 
Because when you have all these different crops with different crop cycles, the question you need to ask most days is, what am I soaking or sowing today? Because if you don't start that process, nothing else happens. So, so this, when I started crop planning, was the question I had to answer. What am I doing today? Co covering or uncovering a crop, I can, I can look and tell whether a crop needs to be uncovered. I can work that out but I cannot calculate just off the top of my head whether I should be sowing or soaking something today. So that is something that the, the crop planning helps us do. So hopefully that answers the, the, the question above in terms of how we deal with things with, with different um, um, uh, uh, days to maturity, basically. And then the other aspect here is um, you see how far ahead you need to be thinking in order to make sure you have the crops that you need. And so we really are, um, this is why we really push our customers for recurring orders. We're gonna put you on a recurring order and we need 10 days notice if you want to cancel. This is what you see with a lot of microgreens growers, which is a good policy though I never stick to it. Like people cancel, they cancel. I mean, trying to tell them they have to pay for something they're not gonna get, it's, it just doesn't work. Um, and we'll talk about this a little bit later in product shifting actually in the next session about how you work with those situations. Okay, so um, that is the end of that, the basic stuff I wanna cover in terms of that. I wanna take a look at a couple of uh, spreadsheet layouts just to give you a sense of how, um, um, uh, how this sort of plays out. But do folks have some questions? I see a question here from Kelly that I'll answer. And then if anything we, we talked about wasn't clear, you can throw a question in there. So the question here, do clients ever get mad they can't have it the same week and aren't understanding? I mean, clients get mad all the time, not my problem. Um, you can't, uh, uh, so this is my seriously flippant answer, obviously, nothing you can do about that. Um, but um, we're gonna talk about this in session two, uh, when we talk about uh, crop buffers and shifting products, because th the question you're asking is, well, if I'm, only if I'm only planting based on my orders, how do I increase my orders and account for that? So this is essentially what you're asking there. And we'll talk about that in the second one uh, in terms of how we do that and uh, different ways. Yeah, there's lots of different ways to do that. Uh, and again, the idea is to not plant too much, but have a little bit extra to account for those orders. And there's a couple of ways we can do that. Is it possible to start and harvest everything on one cycle? You mean everything having the same sowing date and uncover date and harvest date? Is that what you mean, Rachel? No, nope, can't do that. I mean, to a degree, um, no, I mean, you really can't. Some stuff just grows too fast. Some stuff just grows too slow. You cannot have the same cycle for basil as you do for radish. Basil can be 20 to 30 days, radish is seven days. Could you drag radish out to 30 days? You could, be the worst radish ever but you cannot get basil down to seven days. So this is why the, the planning becomes so important. Now there's some crops that you can, if, if, if you've got uh, some things on a seven day cycle and something's on an eight day cycle, you can kind of tweak things, but generally you're gonna do better to find the cycle that works best for that crop because that's what's gonna give you the best crop. That's what's gonna give you the best product and that's what's gonna keep your customers coming back. So you don't want to force too much. And, and we've done this. I definitely have forced things to fit my schedule. Uh, and it, it can it takes a, a little bit more management because you're stressing things out to a degree. So in our production system for the food peddlers, we had everything at a very high temperature. I mean, temperatures that would most people would flip out at seeing. You know, in the summer, we'd be, you know, 90 degrees Fahrenheit in our production area. And that really shifts uh, crop cycles, um, but it also helped us fit our schedule better. So um, yeah, you can only change things a little bit. So one thing you might do, for example, if you wanted to slow down a sunflower or a pea crop is you soak it for a shorter amount of time or you don't soak it at all. That means it's gonna take longer to mature because it doesn't get that sort of uh, catalyst that you get from soaking. Um, but the idea is for you to find the optimum growth cycle for your crop so you get the best quality crop you can and that's what's gonna give you the best product. So shift things a bit, but if you try to cheat too much, you're just gonna pay for it in crop, crop quality. Yeah, so that's it. And so that, like, like that, um, you know, like that, I um, just wanna go back to the cycle. Yeah, so you see here, 
um, yeah, I mean, this is, and this was, is, is what it's like. And it gets, I mean, it can be frustrating because we had, you know, we had about seven to 10 crops going at a time. And what we found there was like a major planting day, like Mondays and Thursdays were always big planting days. Our, our, um, our sunflower and our pea would get planted then. And those were the bulk of our sales. But then on Tuesday, which is our harvest day, we had to sow the radish and the wheatgrass. And so sowing crops when you've got harvest to do can be a bit of a pain in the ass. But that's the reality. So you learn to build um, routines into those cycles. So, so yeah, so that's basically you, you, you will learn to create a weekly routine uh, around your crop cycles in that regard. Uh, oh, so you're thinking of, so you're thinking of, uh, so short answer, no, Kelly, um, uh, scarifying the seed. That's not something you generally have to do with, with uh, microgreen seeds. I mean, if you wanted to try something like, um, I think lupin, for example, they, they think you should scarify it. It's just, um, yeah, it's generally not. Uh, I mean, that would just be such a pain in the ass, though it can be done. So no, most microgreen seeds are, are pretty quick germinators, don't need a lot of, um, don't need a lot of prompting other than a, a bit of soaking. Yeah. yeah, we're trying to avoid extra work at all costs here. Um, okay, so you can continue to ask questions. I'm gonna switch screens to a different, oops. Go and I'm gonna. I've got. Now we're going to take a look at. Oh, this is gonna work. Actually, what I'm gonna do? So I'm gonna shift this up here. And share this way. There we go. Okay. So I'm gonna start off here. Just gonna shift this over here. Okay, so this is sort of the single harvest. So now I've got all these chat boxes and everything in the way here. Let's get you over there and you're down over here. Okay. Um, so here you can see, so this is kind of an expanded version of the, of the crop cycle I was showing you with these four crops. So you can see, you know, basically on Wednesday, every Wednesday I'm sowing pea and every Thursday I'm soaking it. Every Tuesday I'm gonna sow cilantro. So even though the idea behind crop planning can get quite complex, the reality is you end up doing the same tasks every week. What's the thing that changes every week? If your tasks don't change, what's the major things that's gonna change? So your orders are gonna change and what is that gonna change about your, uh, your soaking and sowing? Yeah, exactly. So I know on Wednesday, I'm soaking pea seed. In fact, it was a real pain in the ass soaking pea seed on Wednesday because there was no, no other task on Wednesdays in our system, Wednesdays and Sundays. The only task there was ever to do was soak pea seed. And you had to go in in the evening so you could do an overnight soak. And it'd be like 9.30 at night and I'd just be getting ready for bed and be like, oh my God, I need to go soak the pea seed. Uh, I still have traumatic memories of that. So. Uh, so it's one of those things actually where we couldn't actually manipulate the cycle to fit into a more reasonable schedule. So real pain on the butt in that regard. Um, yeah, so this is going to change. This isn't going to change on a week to week basis, but the amount you do soak or so is, or what's another thing that might change with this actually? Variety, exactly. So we might introduce uh, we might introduce a new crop or we might actually have no orders for a certain crop in one week so it won't show up. It'd be like, all right, no pea orders. We don't have to soak on Wednesday. Um, though we probably would soak some anyways, just in case. Um, so yeah, you might have a variety that didn't get, um, uh, that didn't get uh, ordered or you might introduce a new variety. There's a few things that we would do on a seasonal basis. Uh, so instead of overnight soak, could you soak longer and start in the afternoon? Yes, uh, I found my experience with pea is they need 12 hours. Uh, like they really needed that. 10 hours was, was that often, often wasn't enough and 16 hours was too much. Uh, so I found there was this real sweet spot almost at exactly 12 hours. 
And so in that system, you know, if I sew at seven, soak at seven in the morning, that means I'm sewing at seven at night. That was actually just as big a headache. So we found the overnight soak actually made the most sense. Uh, but you could, and it might be, you know, we, we didn't have a day that, that lasted that long. Our days ended up being pretty short. So yes, in theory, you could, you could be doing that, um, but we just found the overnight soak worked best for our system, despite my whining about it there. Um, yeah, so we might introduce new varieties or crops. The other reason this might change would be with seasonality. Uh, you've got sort of your spring, summer, fall, and winter seasons, depending where you are. There's sometimes there's massive changes between those seasons, and sometimes there's just little changes. So we would shift our crop cycles. When it got cooler, we might add a day to crop cycles to give them a little bit more time. And when it gets hotter, we might reduce it by a day. So there might be certain times in the year where you do shift the crop cycle of some crops, and that's going to change your routine a little bit. So something to keep in mind there. But that is not going to be something that happens on a week-to-week -week basis. Um, and then just taking a look here. So in this system, we're looking at these crop cycles when you have two harvests a week. And why this, I think, is important to consider is we're going to look at cilantro here. So, so cilantro is a, a slightly longer um, crop cycle. So if you look at, if we start with this cilantro here and we go all the way down to this cilantro here, we sow, 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 and we're doing our fourth sowing on the day we harvest the first one. So in this case, we actually have four cycles of cilantro going at a time. So this becomes a space issue. So you have to kind of, when you have longer uh, cycle crops, that's going to limit how much it's going to take up a lot more space. So seeing something like this, when I looked at this, I'm like, oh, I could have four uh, different uh, batches of cilantro going at a time. So that means, I mean, I have to have space for that. And space is often a limiting factor for folks. So this is another thing this sort of thing really uh, helps out with. Uh, okay, so going back to this idea of understanding crop cycles, and what your week looks like. So in seed leaf, we, we have a week view of your tasks. And this is just sort of a, a general look at what's going to happen this week based on how many trays you need to soak, sow, and uncover. And so you can kind of look at like Tuesday's looking like a pretty big day, Thursday's looking like a pretty big day, and then we've got our harvest day and sowing. So these are days where I know I'm going to need more staff. But on a week-to-week -week basis, this barely changes at all. All that's changing is um, how much we're doing. And, and, this, and this model doesn't even change because it's just, a, it's just all, all repetitive order. So your system will change. You're gonna get cancellations. You're gonna get people who need extra stuff for events. You're gonna get new orders, but your cycles will all stay the same. So I like this view because it really helps lay out what my week is gonna look like. And it reminds me that every week is mostly the same. I'm just really focused on, my, uh, on how much I'm gonna sow of each thing. Um, uh, what information do you use to determine crop cycle? So we covered this, Carol. Uh, this goes to get into your days of maturity, uh, your days to germination, and then you know how much crop or how much product you need to grow crop for. So uh, this goes back, and you can take a look at that in the recording if you, if you want to go back and look at that, how we use that. So we'll take a look. So what we're going to do here, I'm going to show you the, the spreadsheet, the very ridiculous spreadsheet that I created over many years to do um, these calculations. Now, this is more advanced than the stuff we're talking about here because I didn't want to get into a lot of this stuff. So there's features in there we haven't talked about, but just to give you a sense of how it ends up getting organized in spreadsheet form. Um, so I'm just going to move some stuff around here. Close that, move that there. Okay. So here is my customer list. So here I've got a column of my customers. I have my customer type here. So that helps uh, categorizing our sales by customer type. And again, it's like we got a lot of restaurants. So probably we have a lot of restaurant sales. Uh, and then we have our route here. And this was actually quite important for us at the food peddlers because we did our deliveries by bike. And you don't want to be taking unnecessary routes and going over there and then way over there when somebody could be sort of grouping things together. So that was really, really important for us. Uh, this may not be important at all if you're just doing pickups and a farmer's market. You may not have delivery routes at all. So it's one of those things that might be optional. In terms of our seeds, now there's a lot of information here. And here we're kind of, again, we're separating our crop and our seed because seed can be used to grow multiple different types of, of crops. And then as we scroll across, 
because we know the pricing of our seed and our sowing rate, we're able to calculate really easily what the, uh, what the cost per sowing of a tray is. So for these wheat grass cells, for example, which are just little cat grass cells, it takes three cents in seed, whereas for sunflower, it takes 94 cents for seed. Uh, do, did you ever add extra days of harvest for restaurants? I'm not sure what you mean there, Kelly. So if you, if you want to reword or, or go into a bit more detail, um, I'll, uh, I'll keep on this and then I'll, I'll come back to that. Um, so in this, in this system in particular, I, I kept my crops and my products together. So here's my crops along the top here. And, and then I've got all my information down here. So my sowing rate that I talked about, whether we need to soak and for how long, our days to maturity, our days of germination, and our yield. So all my, all my crop information for sunflower is right here. And then I have my product information below. So you can see these end up being very, very big spreadsheets because they have to have a lot of information. So for each of my, my sizes, I have my weight. And then in this system, there's two prices. So there's a wholesale and a retail price. And then um, we've got our tray pricing here. So this is information, you know, again, that I want to have all sorted out before I even start selling. So there's a lot of front loaded work that goes in here uh, to make sure that I have everything I need. So in terms of orders, orders, how you record orders gets more complex, uh, so complex it takes a really long time to load. <laughs> um, way too long for my liking. Um, uh, yeah, if you're just doing 10, 20 trays a week, your, your crop management can be quite easy. But as you get into many, many customers and many orders a week, it, it, gets, it can get to be quite, um, it can get to be quite uh, demanding. Okay, so uh, extra harvest days to keep up with their demand. So no, I would never, I would never um, add a harvest day, I think, just for restaurants. It would have to be, I mean, theoretically, maybe... Um, I would just have two harvest days a week. So like I said, we had a Tuesday, Friday harvest, and that was meant to do our harvest for restaurants, home deliveries, farmers markets, wholesale. We would do everything within those two days. Um, now, one thing we would do in terms of demand, nice thing, and I didn't talk about this, but in terms of how you as a, as a production manager manage your orders, so we would get new customers. And because we had a Tuesday, Friday harvest, what generally happened is our Friday harvest was often the bigger harvest because we had a Saturday market and markets did pretty well. So our Friday harvest would often be bigger than our Tuesday harvest. So when we got new customers on and they only wanted a one day a week delivery, we'd say, hey, we're gonna put you on our Tuesday delivery because if you only want it once a week, we, we, we don't have enough capacity to do it for you on Friday. So we're gonna to have to do it on Tuesday. Now, sometimes, going back to the previous questions, customers would get mad. Uh, some people are just dicks. Um, um, but what we might do in that case is like, okay, we really want this customer. They really want a Friday harvest. So we would go to our existing customers that were just getting one delivery a week on Fridays and say, hey, how would you feel if we shifted you to a Tuesday delivery? And so this may or may not work out, but there's never any harm in asking. And a lot of the time we've, we've done that with customers and they'd be like, oh yeah, that would actually be way better. We already get way too deli many deliveries on Fridays. And so shifting to Tuesday makes that a lot easier. So you can really work things out with your, with your current customer base in terms of that. So yeah, in terms of demand, I mean, that's gonna depend how you manage your orders and it may not be restaurants that are driving the demand. It might be your wholesaler or your grocers or your, or your farmer's market. So, I mean, if you add an extra day of harvest for restaurants, what you're saying is we have so much business that we, we, we can't do all our harvest in, in two days, then you're actually just shifting from a two day a week of harvest to a three day a week harvest. So you might go from Tuesday, Thursday to Monday, Wednesday, Friday. And that often happens as you grow. There are operations that are big enough that they're harvesting every day. So that's really gonna vary. And that's really gonna depend on your scale and your capacity to do all those tasks on a certain day. Uh, okay, so orders, looking at things here. So here's our set order date, and then we've got all our information. Each order has a customer, a product. I talked about our wholesale or retail pricing in this case. Uh, and in this case, we also separate our size for our product. We've got a quantity and we've got a price. So this is the key information in an order that drives all this information. 
Uh, because we already know that Bob's grocery is a grocer, this system auto fills it, and then it does this very simple calculation of determining what the value of that order total is. And then, I mean, I won't get into formulas here, but then we get into uh, the system sums everything up for us. So we know what our total for each customer and our total for the week is. And then it goes and organizes it by, um, so it's generating these uh, soaking, sewing, and uncover dates, our number of trays. And in this case, it actually tells us what seed lot we're, we're, we're drawing from. And that's really important for just traceability if you need to do a recall. So these are all calculations that are done based on these orders, based on our preloaded uh, product information and our preloaded crop information. So the spreadsheet is just drawing from these to do all these calculations. And this spreadsheet has something like 30,000 uh, uh, rows in this sheet alone. So there's millions of calculations that happen in, in all this to, to account for a full season of um, production. Now, this format here, I mean, this tells you what you need to do but obviously it's not organized by date, right? This is just organized by crop. And so you don't wanna go, it's like, oh, today's June 15th and then kind of go through here and figure out what your June 15th stuff is. And so what we've done is just created another page that separates things by task. And so I put in a date, it auto fills all the dates and then I can open these just to take a look. So on Monday we come in and we just basically look at the task list and go, what do we need to do today? And in the early days, you need to have faith in your system. I mean, you look at the stuff and you're like, that doesn't seem like enough, or that seems like too much. But if, you're, if your calculations are correct, it's gonna be, it's gonna be accurate. And, and one of the things we do is we have a little, uh, you know, another calculation here, it says, so when we're soaking the seed, what, uh, what harvest are we soaking it for? And the reason is, if I'm unsure about these numbers, I can go take a look at the orders for June 28th. So I'll just go back there, close this one. Uh, oh yeah, June 28th is a Tuesday. So you can see this is very big and complicated. I mean, it's so big that Google hates me. Um, do, 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 June 28th. So I might go in here. So the reason I do this is, is the last chance you have to sort of uh, double check your orders is just before selling or soaking. So I might go through here and take a look at these. Okay, okay, Bob's Grocery, Jane's Grocery, Bill's Diner. It's like, oh, I'm missing Chris's Cafe's order. I forgot this. So I, here's a chance for me to put that in. And so if I was to do, I don't even know if there's a Chris's Cafe in here. Ah, I don't even have a Chris's Cafe. Oh my God. Uh, oh, let's go with Kate's Cafe. Do we have a Kate in there already? And uh, yeah, so maybe uh, I forgot. Yeah, they're doing the five by five sunflower and they're getting the wholesale price. And that is a tray and they're taking 25 of those because they're really popular. And uh, those were say $5 each. So it's the last chance I have to make a change there um, for that date, even though I may not even be selling that on the day. So don't wanna get too off on that. So. Organizing things by tasks really, really helps um, understand what you need to be doing for that day, as opposed to finding the information you need to do for that day. And that five by five, uh, actually it's probably, you can see up here, it's actually still loading. It has to do so many calculations, this one, in order to, to add that task. So this ends up, I mean, even in a big spreadsheet like this, where you end up spending all your time is putting in your orders, and checking your tasks. You don't spend a lot of time on your crop and product page because once you have that established, it's done. You might change it a little bit. Maybe you change your sizing, your prices, but you don't do that every week. But every week you take orders and every week you have tasks. So you set up this big system and then you basically spend all your time within these two things, your orders and your tasks. So in that regard, it ends up being fairly simple, uh, but it's a lot of work to sort of get set up uh, to, be in that, uh, to be in that space. So. That is all I want to cover for today, uh, and, and I'm, I'm um, happy to continue answering questions. I just wanted to show a quick, because I mean, I know some of you have some questions um, about a few things, and I want to quickly just pop up the, uh, pop up what the, uh, I'm going to cover in the next session is, which is my, maybe answering some of your questions that might already be um, 
in your minds already. So, so yeah, so looking at the second webinar. So one thing I'm gonna talk about is buffers. So one is your label weight versus your packing weight. I mean, our, our, our label may say 100 grams, but maybe we pack for 105. So that's what we do our calculations with. Rounding up calculations we talked about. We use a concept called virtual customers, uh, which is a customer that doesn't exist, but it gives you another bit of a buffer for samples or for new customers. We'll look at product mixes and how to do the calculations there. Talk a little bit about overnight soaks, uh, even though we did get into that. And then we'll talk about farmer's market planning where you do not know what your actual sales will be. Uh, you're just sort of hoping you know what they'll be and then shifting products. And so that's the idea of shifting products between different customers on a week to week basis if you happen to be short in some of your, your products.